how I was as a younger person, I really did think that there was a formula to life. And if I could just map it all out, I could avoid pain. I could accomplish a whole lot. I could do a whole yeah. lot for God, you know? And so I was hard charging after my life, assuming that, you know, I'm doing all the right things. I'm checking all the boxes, so I'm going to be okay. And as life unfolded, though, you know, and to the point where I find myself as a single mom, I'm realizing that formula doesn't exist, you know. And, but then the, there's a fear that creeps in with that that, well, I thought I could build my life according to this formula and I was going to be fine. So now if there's no formula, I'm not going to be fine. How do I be fine? You know, and it's God in his kindness, though, that reve he reveals to us those things that we've been relying on that are not him. And the sufficiency of living life by yourself, mm -hmm. the quote unquote sufficiency, when the only true life that we'll experience the depth of life is life where we are completely dependent on him. And so in this season of single motherhood, he has shown me, though, all of the things, not just from my marriage, but from the time before that, that I was leaning on that were not him and needed to now make those changes because he had me now walking into an entirely new season where I wasn't going to be able to make it without him. How old were your kids um, then when you were divorced and how old are they now? So this happened all about five years ago. So I have a 14, an 11, and a five. So at the time that this all took place, I'm not great at math, but, <laughs> but, yeah, it's fine, but we can tell you had a very little one. <laughs> yeah. Nine, seven, and uh, just a handful of months. Yeah. 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 In the book, I love the different thoughts that you deal with, you know, just when a single mom is thinking, well, God is punishing me, God has rejected me, like certainly this is why these things have happened, what would you want to say to her? Yeah, I love reading through scripture because these thoughts and these stories are all in there, mm -hmm. you know? And the thing that I discovered, though, in my trying to figure out who God was and who I was now going through this new season of my life is that as I just dug into scripture and really immersed myself in there, I started to discover these stories that we don't often hear, or they're not told from an, an entire perspective. And for example, one of those is Hagar. And Hagar is the first mother, single mother of the Bible. And so often her story is told as a blip in the Abraham and Sarah story. You know, she yeah, was- Yeah, a little she side was, note. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like that story is where Abraham and Sarah took things into their own hands and got it wrong. But in that is this beautiful relationship that God has with Hagar, where she's being mistreated and she's been exiled and God draws so near to her and he reveals himself in a way that to this point in the Bible, only Abraham had experienced. So Abraham had had God tell him, you're going to be the father of these many nations, your descendants, you won't be able to even count them. He tells Hagar the same thing, you know, and that is so fascinating on so many different levels, totally. but it, but it was the realization that God has promises. Mm. God has promises for all of us. God has promises for single moms. God has promises for people who ended up in seasons of their life. They didn't think they were going to be in. And you know what? Hagar wasn't perfect. Hagar was being abused and exploited, but Hagar also was in a competition mode with Sarah, you know? And so there were some things that we can't point to Hagar's story or any of these stories that are in this book and say, oh, well, it was because they did this or because they did that or because they had this going on for them. All of these stories, and hers included, show us who God is by mm -hmm. the things that he does for everyday, average, ordinary people. That is amazing. I had not thought about how God speaks to Abraham and then God speaks to Hagar and how amazing that is in the sense of if you think, oh, God isn't into women or God isn't into single moms or God isn't into this to be like, no, he he speaks. <laughs> and they're literally a chapter apart. We're talking 15 and 16 in the book of Genesis, you know? It's so amazing. But again, I knew God gave me eyes to see that because I yeah. needed it, you know? Yeah. And that's just the most incredible way that God takes care of us is he knows precisely what we need. Mm -hmm. And if we go seeking him, 
he is not going to hide it from us. He is going to absolutely make those things pop out to us in a way that they, we've never seen before. Yeah. We live in this crazy busy world and you know all these things are happening. And especially I think for the single mom, she needs some shalom in her life. Mm -hmm. Define shalom and how you have found more of it for yourself. Yeah. I love this word because a lot of times when we hear this translated into English, it just means peace to us. Mm -hmm you know, and shalom means so much more. Shalom is what we were created for. It is well-being. It is harmony with God. It is wholeness and fullness of, of, our, of our life with him. And I'll be honest with you, Arlene, like a lot of us are not experiencing a whole lot of shalom in our <laughs> yeah, you lives, right? Yeah, you three kids, you got lots going on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, but on top of this too, we're experiencing a lot of brokenness because that shalom was initially shattered at the fall. Mm -hmm. All of us are dealing with this, of this living in a place that we were not made for, you know, and this is something I've read a lot in the work of Dr. Dan Allender, but this restoration of shalom is what God had planned for us that when he sent Adam and Eve out from the garden, it was for the purpose of bringing them back into relationship mm -hmm. through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so shalom is our birthright. Shalom was what we were created for. And where circumstances of our lives would tell us God doesn't care, God's far away, that this is all there is. God is saying, no, 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 my daughters, yeah. come close to me. I want to show you what I have in store. Mm -hmm. And those are things that we can experience little by little by little in greater degree through our lives in the here and now, yeah. but that it will reach its fullness in eternity. And so in that, our hope is the fact that eternity has been secured for us by Jesus, and but we don't have to wait until that time to start experiencing his restoration of shalom in our own lives. Yeah. In your book, you know, you're talking about that you are made for more than rejection. You are made for more than the bare minimum. What do you think are some of the common struggles that you hear from the single mom? Because you're so active in single mom ministry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When it comes to the season, the circumstances, mm -hmm. sometimes those feel awfully defining, you know? And it can seem sometimes how we ended up here was from our own choices, and sometimes it's from somebody else's choices. And when either of or both of those things happen, it's not clear to us what the big plan is. You know, none of us ever intended for this to be our lives. None of us ever thought, oh, I will love to raise my kids by myself you know, or have to do it in circumstances that are confrontational or difficult with an ex-spouse or ex-partner yeah. or something like that. And so there is all this swirling around you, all this chaos, all this doubt, all this confusion about who God really is and what is the plan and why am I here? And, you know, that brings up shame about, you know, well, if I would have done it differently, or maybe God's mad at me, or he's trying to teach me a lesson, you know, and that just stems from so many variety of different experiences that all culminate, you know, in the yeah. circumstance where you find yourself. And that is, it's so a trick of the enemy, though, to try to get us to look at our stories in the past and say, see, God wasn't there, or see, you're not good enough, or see, if you would have done something just a little differently. And he does all of that to drive a wedge between us and God, that we would look at our circumstances past and believe that's all there is left for us in the future. And God, so much through the Bible, shows us over and over and over in the stories, again, that we've mentioned about these you know, other people, that God sees our circumstances where we are weakened and where we are not able to do things for ourselves and says, I have, I've always been here for you. I still have a plan for you. I'm still working things out. But in that is an invitation for us to trust him in a way that we never have before. 
and trust him in ways that cause us to question some of the things maybe we did do that have led us towards the situation we find ourselves in or that have been reactions to ways that we were treated, lies that we've believed, all of those sorts of things. So that through our circumstances, he shows himself so mighty on our behalf, so gentle on our behalf, an advocate on our behalf, a warrior on our behalf. So all of those spaces where you feel like you don't have enough or that you aren't enough, he steps in to show that he is, 